together, I want to take you on a visual, imaginary trip. Are you ready to go? All right, we're going to a tropical place. All right, see, I like it already, right? We're going to a tropical place where it's always beautiful. The weather is so fine, you never have to worry about getting a chill. You never have to worry about any problems at all. There's no wild animals to bother you. It's just beautiful, it's glorious. The food is fantastic. Hello? Sounds good? You're coming on, you with me, sir? All right, the food is, in fact, you, you, there's so much fruit growing all over the place. All you do is walk around and you eat. If you're in a garden, actually, you're on a mountainside and you have this tremendous view and you're staying in, in a garden. It's like a tremendously, gar it's like a king's garden. It's got everything in it. It's got all sorts of flowers all set up and there's all sorts of fruit trees and all these beautiful things. In fact, it's such a wonderful place that the Lord called it the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Now, I've got a verse up on the screen, and it says, basically, I will put hatred between you and the woman. And you know when this takes place? It takes place in the Garden of Eden. And he says, uh, I will put hatred between you and the woman, or enmity, and between your seed and her seed. It will crush your head. And you... And, and, uh, it, and you shall bruise or crush his heel. In other words, the seed of the woman is going to be in a battle against the seed of the serpent. And one day, finally, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. But while he does so, the serpent will bite his heel and crush him or kill him. So there's two deaths, basically. <coughs> This is the war that we talk about all the time. We talk about we're in a spiritual war. This is the war we're in. We call it the seed war. The war between the seeds. One of the basic things, there's a, there's a book that gained a lot of favor back a little while ago. And it was written many, many hundreds, thousands of years ago uh, in Japan by a man named Sun Tzu. And it was called The Art of War. He was a warrior. It's been read, um, especially in the last 15, 20 years, 30 years or so, it's been used in corporate America, in corporations around the world actually, teaching corporate leaders how to strategize to build their businesses and to become conquerors in their area. And so it's been read quite a lot. In fact, a lot of, a lot of people have recommended reading it just so that you can get the idea and the concept of how to excel in life. So the art of war, one of the things that Sun Tzu wrote about is he said is you have to know your enemy. You have to know your enemy. The problem is we don't know who the serpent's seed is. We know who the woman's seed is. It's Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we're, we're brought along through the, that, that line about Jesus all the way from Genesis right up to Revelation. And you see Jesus in every single book of the Bible. But who is the serpent's seed? Who are we fighting? If you don't know who you're fighting, how are you going to win? That's right. How do you know what's going on? And so I want to share with you a little bit this morning about this. And just before I do that quickly, I have to make one quick announcement that uh, yes, Dell is the winner of the free breakfast at the cafe. <laughs> she said that. Yeah, she's the winner yeah, of the free that. breakfast at the cafe because... The amount of money that was put aside for the mortgage-free month in the jar was $771.07, and uh, she guessed the closest to that, which was $803.62. So although she was over, she was the closest. And so it has been decreed that she gets a free breakfast in the Deacon's Cafe. All right? Praise God. She cheated. <laughs> she, she cheated, she cheated, no, she didn't cheat, she had the strategy, she had the strategy of war, amen, hallelujah. So let's read chapter 3 together as we go into this understanding about the serpent's seed, okay, in the seed war. Genesis chapter 3, now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version, it's a little different, if we have the Revised Standard Version you can put it up. 
But the serpent, now we have to remember, I've said this a few times recently, the word serpent does not mean snake. Okay? It doesn't mean a snake came in the garden and started talking. I mean, most of you, if a snake came in the garden, you'd back up right away. If he started talking, you're out of there. You're dead. You're gone. It wasn't a snake. You have to realize that they had been in the garden. Adam had been with God for a while before Eve was created. And Adam knew God, and Adam also knew there were other beings who we would call divine beings, sons of God. There were others that were Malach, messengers of God. And they were of a different order. Adam knew that they were not like all the other beasts of the field, all the other creatures on, on the planet Earth that he, had, that he was in with God, because they were shining. They were like luminescent. In fact, when you read in the Bible about angels appearing, when you read about the sons of God appearing, you always see or, or you see that they are shining creatures, shining ones, brilliant, bright. Their feet shine like, like polished brass, you know, eyes like fire and, and things like that. And you always see that they're, they look like men, but they, they're a little different. And there's always something you can tell. In fact, even if Sodom and Gomorrah, when the two angels that had had meal, had a dinner with the Lord God and Abraham and Sarah a day or two before. Mm -hmm. They actually had a meal together. Mm -hmm. The Lord God appeared mm -hmm. with two men, it says. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Abraham bowed down and worshipped him. And he said to Sarah, quick, make a meal. And she got a, she got a lamb and she made a lamb stew right away. Mm -hmm. And then she came out while they were talking in the, in the shade of the tent flap. And she prepared the meal and they sat down, the Bible says, and they ate together. And then the next part of the Bible says that these two men were angels. And that's how Abraham knew this is the Lord because there's a difference in the appearance. Something different. When these two angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah knew they were different. And they demanded at, the, at, the, at, the, at a demand of death to Lot that, they, that he let these two men come out so they could know them. They knew there was something different about them. Their, their appearance is different. You see, they're made of different stuff. See, we are of the earth, earthly. 1 Corinthians 15, I've been speaking about this a little bit also since we talked about Easter and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 says there's two kinds of bodies, celestial bodies and earthly bodies. And we who have worn the earthly body will put it off in death and put on the celestial body in the resurrection. Jesus had a celestial body. They, when they saw Jesus, think about it, they, one of them screamed out, it's a ghost. He said, I'm not a ghost or spirit. Touch me, feel me, handle me, put your fingers in the holes in my hands. Put your hand in the hole in my side. I am not a ghost. I am flesh and bone. And so this celestial body has a corporeality to it. You can touch it. You can feel it. It can eat. And yet it's in a different order, different type of life. The heavenly is earthly, corruptible. We're subject to sickness. We're subject to sickness and pain and sorrow and death. We're subject to all these things, even as uh, Jesus was himself in his earthly body. And yet the celestial or the heavenly is not like that. It's glorious, the Bible says. And so these creatures, these sons of God, these divine beings, these Moloch, these messengers, when they appear in the Garden of Eden, when they're with the Lord doing different things, because you've got you to realize the Garden of Eden is not just one or two, three days. This is time going by. And when the Lord appears, he may have just been talking with a couple of these angels. He may have been walking with them. And he comes and he appears to them. And so while Eve is in the garden one day with Adam and they're doing things, this is the encounter that they have with the serpent which is the Hebrew word nakash, and it doesn't mean snake, it means a shining one. And so let's read it that way. Now the shining one was more subtle than any other creature God had made. Now everybody is a creature. We're creatures. Animals are creatures of a different order. Birds are creatures of another order. Angels are creatures of a different order. And so don't get hung up on the word creature or beast, and think that, you know, that's, that's uh, we're talking about, you know, like we think of us, you know, wolves and lions and bears. The Bible tells us in heaven, 
that there were four living beasts at the throne. One with the face of a lion, one with the face of an eagle, one with the face of a calf or a lamb or an ox, and one with the face of a man. And they were called the cherubim before the throne of God. They were called beasts. Beast simply means in the old language, a living creature. It has a life. We think of the beast, we think of beauty and the beast. You know, we think of the wolf type creature, the werewolf type creature, or that ugly creature that, you know, the beauty found and, and he loved her. And we, we think of, of, of creatures, we think of dragons and werewolves and things like that. That's not what the word is talking about. It's just talking about a living creature, a living being. And so the serpent, the shining one, was more subtle than any other creature the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say to you, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now you have to think about something else. He didn't just walk up to her and say to her, hey, did God say this to you? He started a conversation. The Bible gives us what we need to know. It doesn't tell us every single word. They have a conversation. Hey, how are you doing today? You know, you look pretty good. You're looking good yourself. You know, what did you have? I had a pomegranate. I had some tomatoes. I had made a little salad with cucumbers and greens and escarole beans. You know, I had some things here in the garden. You know, whatever. They were talking and finally he says, he said, did God really say to you that you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the, to the shining one, we can eat of the fruit of all the trees of the garden. But, did, but God did say, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. You know how sometimes you are... Uh, you embellish something when you're talking. You, you embellish it. You, you make it a little bigger than it really is. Because the Lord said to Adam, we have recorded in Genesis, he said, thou shalt not eat of the tree of the, of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't say don't eat of it, don't touch it. But you know, even though she just embellished a little bit, she says, we can't eat it, we can't even touch it. You know? Making it more important. Now, it's in the midst of the garden. But the, but the Bible also tells us there were two trees in the midst of the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Every time they go to eat of the tree of life, they have a choice. Do we live, eat and live, or do we disobey and die? And so far, they've been making the right choices. But then she says, we shall not even touch it. And the serpent, the shining one, says to the woman, you will not die. Now he's calling God a liar. You see, because the serpent war, the seed war, that began here on earth, there was a war with the serpent going on in the heavenly realm long before that. He was God's enemy long before that. He was a part of God's divine counsel. He was a part of, one, he was a part of this creation of a whole different dimension, a whole different type of living, a whole different type of life, where you can go and appear and, and seem to fly where you want to go and just appear and disappear and your body is different and all these things. He was a part of that. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel that he was in the garden of God. And then they had all sorts of commerce going on. And they had everything you read about in Ezekiel 28. It talks about life before life in the garden of God. It says he was there. And he was, he was, the, he was the most beautiful of God's creations. And he was until sin was found in his heart. Until he decided he would exalt his throne above God's throne. He would receive worship. And so that war that began aeons ago, he was now bringing to earth. Jealousy was the root. Hatred was the root. There is no anger like the anger of a woman scorned. And in this sense, this is what it's like. Lucifer the shining one, the morning star, the brightest star in the sky, the best of God's creation, looks at the plan of God as God in the divine council talks about what he's going to do in this new creation he's made called the universe. Wait a second. When did the universe begin? It began with the Big Bang. <laughs> right? The Big Bang was, and God said, let there be light. Boom. And things out of nothing came into something. The angels were there before that happened. Job, the oldest book in the Bible, says when God said that and created this universe, the morning stars sang for joy. So there was a creation before this creation. There was a universe before this universe. 
We are living in a multiverse. Many dimensions. We're bound into one, but there are others that are interlocked with us. The angels, the angelic beings, the Malak, the messengers of God, the divine ones, the sons of God, they live in that other universe, and they can come into this universe and go out of this universe. We can't do that. In fact, it's so rare that it happens. It, will, it happened to Paul the Apostle once that he speaks of. He says, I was taken out of this body and brought to a different place. And then we know that Enoch, who served God, the seventh from Adam, served God, and then he was taken up. And he walked with God and he was not no more. Here, he was there. Elijah was taken up. A fiery chariot passes by and the whirlwind comes behind it and he gets taken up in the whirlwind. He left this earth. He went to a different dimension. He didn't die. He appeared later on with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Hermon, where Jesus was transfigured. There's so many things in the Bible that if we just get a grasp of why, we'll understand and see the bigger picture. And so here we are back here in the, in the garden. And so he says, you will not die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will be one of us. The shining one. You'll be like God's. Because in the Bible it says, single, plural, we're not positive. It's not just saying you'll be like God himself, but actually he's saying you'll be like us. God's keeping something from you. You see, when, when the plan of God was, was given to these other beings, and God says, I'm going to create the universe, they all sang for joy, oh, 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 joy. And then they find out, after thousands of years go by, dinosaurs and all sorts of stuff is on the earth, and the earth is going through all these things, and there's planets and things, so all the solar system and all that. And they're all amazed. And then God says, I'm going to make a man. What's a man? Well, he's going to look like you, look like me, and I'm going to love him. But it's going to be earthly. Won't be celestial like you. Be different. A woman scorned. Satan was like a woman scorned. I'm not good enough for you. You're going to love that more than me? Oh, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. I know this thing is going to be fragile. It's going to fall. It's going to sin. But when it does, I'll redeem it. And the rebellion in heaven took place long before God created man. And part of the rebellion in heaven was because God had a plan for another creation. And they were jealous. And so they began to scheme and to plan and to think, how, why, what can we do? And that's why he says, you'll be like us. You'll know good and evil. You'll know right from wrong. You'll know all the things that you need to know. And so the woman saw the tree was good for food and the, it was delightful to the eyes. It was desired to make one wise. She fell for the trap. She fell for the lie. It's going to make you wise. You know, this, it looks like it's going to make me wise. And so she took of its fruit and ate of it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. They were naked. When God created Adam and fashioned him and formed him of the earth, he then breathed into him the breath of life, the Holy Spirit, and he became a living soul. The Spirit of God lived inside of him. He didn't live by bread alone. He lived by the Spirit of God. And he had a piece of eternity inside of him. And when God created Eve and breathed into her the breath of life, she too had that. But when they sinned and disobeyed God, that spirit left, and they became just frail, fragile, earthly creatures dependent on oxygen, and food, and water no longer dependent on the Spirit of God. They were no longer possessing a piece of eternity inside. They had nothing now but death and destruction. And that's why they were naked. They were naked of the covering of the Spirit of God. And they knew it. You ever do something you knew you weren't supposed to do, and the moment you did it, you knew you were going to get caught? You knew it. You're like, I'm, why did I do it for? I'm going to get caught. 
And then you're like, I wish I didn't do it. But it's too late for wishing. You did it. And you're already suffering. Because you know you're going to get caught. And that's what happened to them. So they hid themselves. And they heard the Lord God in the cool of the day. And the Lord came walking to go fellowship with them and so forth. And then, then they hid from him. And he said, where are you? Why are you hiding? And he said, well, we're hiding because we're naked. There's, a, there's something different about us. We're not connected to you. We don't feel that connection that we had every day of our lives. It's gone. We're, we're uncovered. Naked simply means uncovered. We're uncovered. No Shekinah. No covering. He said, you must have eaten of the tree of Allah. What's a good evil? You disobeyed. What happened? She says, well, the, the shining one came here and he beguiled me. He tricked me. He deceived me. Remember that word deceive because that's the devil's biggest weapon. Mm -hmm. Deceit. So the Lord then called the court together and he sits in judgment and the decree is in verse 15, I will put enmity or hatred or hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush or bruise your head. You shall bruise his or crush his heel. And this is the beginning of the seed war on earth. The seed war was prophesied by the Lord himself. The Lord himself said there's going to be hatred. There's going to be enmity. And we know, as I said earlier, the seed of the woman is Jesus. He is the seed. He's the seed of the woman. He becomes what we call Abraham's seed. In Galatians, in Romans, in the New Testament, he's revealed to us as the seed of Abraham. The one with the promised blessing. The one who will bring what? Galatians chapter 3. He will give you the blessing of Abraham, which is the Spirit. Jesus died not only to forgive us of our sins. He died to give us the Holy Spirit and to restore earth to what it was before mm. to bring the restoration of all things spoken of by the prophets mm. it wasn't just to forgive sin jesus said what's harder forgiving a sin or healing a sickness forgiving sins to god was not that hard mm -hmm. but jesus suffering and dying and, and and being cut off from god and being totally desolate and being left there for a while on the cross totally separated from god that was difficult but he did it because he believed that the Lord would give him the spirit of life again and he would rise from the dead on the third day. And he did it because he loved us and he wanted us to have the Holy Spirit breathed upon us again by the Lord, the creator. Amen. And so when he goes to the upper room and he appears to them and they cry out, it's a ghost. He says, I'm not a ghost. I've come to bring you the blessing of Abraham. I've come to bring you the promise I spoke to you about. I've come to give you the Holy Spirit. And he breathed upon them. And they receive the breath of life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Eternity was given back to man. The clothing, the cloak of eternity, the ability to live, to eat of the tree of life. Every time we break bread and have communion, we're sharing and participating in the tree of life. In fact, Paul the Apostle reveals and says to us, many people are weak and sickly and die before they should because they don't recognize the tree of life. They don't recognize what's in the body and the blood. They don't recognize what's in the communion. And so they just eat it and drink it out of habit or tradition. But if you understand it and you eat it and drink it in faith, it will be life to you. It will be health to you. It will be healing to you. It's a long life for you. Amen. It's a foreshadowing of eternity. Mm. Here now. Yes. Remember when Jesus said, the kingdom of God is coming? Yes. And then he said, to, then he looked at the disciples and he says, you know, for some of you, you know it's here already. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was coming, but it was here. Yeah. Now, if you talk like that to your kids as they're growing up, and you tell them, listen, honey, Christmas is coming, but it's here right now. Mm -hmm. They're going to look and say, what are you talking about, Mom? <laughs> Christmas is three months away. Oh, I'm telling you Christmas is coming, but it's here right now, if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Easter's here, too. Easter's here, too. Mm -hmm. If you can see it, it's here right now. See, it's coming, but it's here. See, they won't understand you. And Jesus was speaking in that type of language. He's saying, it's coming, but it's here. Which is it? Is it here or coming? It's here. Well, but it's not here. It's coming. Mm. You're in eternity already. No. Well, you're not in eternity yet, but it's coming. But it's here. But it's not. But <laughs> You're a new creation, but you're still going to do the same old stuff you do. You're forgiven. You're healed. You're restored. But you're in a battle. And the battle's for your life. Wait a second. But that's what's going on. That's what's happening here. 
There's a heresy, and I'm only going to mention it for a moment. There's a teaching that says that the seed of the serpent was Cain. That the serpent had, and, and, and Eve had a relationship, and the product of that relationship was the firstborn on the earth, Cain. It's a heresy. It was started a long, long time ago. It was believed by some of the Jewish people in ancient days. It was believed by the Gnostics in the early days of the church. And it was totally rebuked and, and, and uh, characterized and labeled as heresy in the first century by the early church fathers. Irenaeus was one of the chief early church fathers. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Apostle. Now, John the Apostle, we know, lived up until around 100 or 100 so years of age. So he lived well into the second century, in the beginning of the second century. Polycarp was one of his disciples who was with him in the second half of that second century, from, let's say, 50 to 100 AD. And he was there as one of John's disciples. And he himself became an apostle, and he had disciples he brought, and Irenaeus was one of his disciples. We know this from church history, from the writings of the church fathers. And Irenaeus, bringing the teaching that John taught Polycarp in the continuation of apostolic doctrine, knew that Cain was not the seed of the serpent. The seed of the serpent was something different because Jesus identified the seed of the serpent. And once he identified it, you could see it throughout the Bible. So Jesus identifies it in John chapter 8. Let's go there. John chapter 8. I'll read from the New Living Translation. I switch around from translations because I like the way one says it better than another. So John chapter 8 verse 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Some of them said, but we are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. If the son sets you free, you are truly free. You are the real deal. Amen. And he said, yes, I realize you're the descendants of Abraham, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your heart for my message. I'm telling you what I saw when I was with my father. But you are following the advice of your father. Our father is Abraham, they declared. No, Jesus replied. If you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you are trying to kill me because I told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitating your real father. They replied, we are not bastards. We are not legitimate children. God himself is our father. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil. You are the serpent seed. Genesis 3.15. He didn't have to say it. They knew it. And you love to do the evil things he does. A liar. A deceiver. Loves power. Wants to be number one. Can't stand anybody who gets in their way. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it's, a, it's consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell you the truth... You just don't naturally believe me. Which of, which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. The people reply, you're a Samaritan devil. 
They all do it, whether they're in religion or politics. Whenever they don't want to hear what you're saying, they make you into something else. They call you names. Shift it. Didn't we say all along that you're possessed by a demon? A demon? The people retorted, you're a Samaritan devil. You're possessed by a demon. Jesus said, no, I have no demon in me, for I honor my father and you dishonor me. And though I have no wish to glorify myself, God is going to glorify me. He is the true judge. I tell you the truth, anyone who obeys my teachings will never die. Glory. There's the clothing from on high. There's the promise of the Holy Spirit. There's the restoration of eternal life in the Garden of Eden. The people said, now we know you're demon-possessed. Even Abraham and the prophets died. But you say anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. <laughs> Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Oh, don't they always say that? Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, if I, want to, if I want glory for myself, it doesn't count. But it is my Father who will glorify me. You say he is our God, but you don't even know him. I know him. If I said otherwise, I would be as great a liar as you are. I mean, Jesus was just talking right straight to them. He wasn't mincing words. He wasn't being politically correct. You know? He says, but I do know him and I obey him. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and he was glad. The people said, you're not even 50 years old. How could you say you saw Abraham? Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham even was. Yes. I am. Woo! Woo! He said, yeah. I am God. Yeah, man. Amen. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. All of a sudden, they couldn't find him. Before Abraham was, I am. They picked up stones to stone him because he made himself equal to God. But he was telling the truth. So now we can clearly see who is the serpent seed? In Jesus' day, it was the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. But before that, it was others. And after that, it was others also. Jesus was crucified to fulfill the prophecy. He, you, you shall crush his heel. He shall crush your head. Romans chapter 16. Let's take a look at something else here. Because I want to just get into this it's coming, but it's here now already. Romans 16, verse 17. Back to the old King James. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark those which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. Those who cause division, those who teach teachings other than what you learned, mark them and avoid them. Separate yourself from them. Don't fellowship with them, for they are those who are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple or the pure. Just like Satan, with fine words and speeches, he deceived Eve. And these, his seed, do the same thing. They go to your churches. They say they're part of you. They're like the Pharisees and the scribes and Sadducees. They say they're the children of God, and yet their actions speak different. He says, For obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. I want you to understand what evil is. Evil lives inside of people who are contrary to the word of God. People who constantly cause divisions in the church. People who are always creating problems among you. Mark them. Avoid them. They're the serpent seed. Not saying they're demon possessed. Not saying this and that. Saying, but they are of their father. They have that spirit working on their life. And he says in verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet soon. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. He's saying, you're in a war. And just like Jesus crushed his head, God is going to crush his head for you soon. So keep fighting. Paul is talking about those who cause divisions. He's talking about them and he's saying, mark them and avoid them. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I just want to give you a couple of ideas, or a couple of examples of this serpent seed so you can identify, mark it, avoid it. There's a reason why. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, the English Standard Version. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. He's saying, it was so bad, it was so hard, I was so depressed, I wanted to die. Mm. Wow. Indeed, I felt like we had received a sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. The same word we receive prophetically today, in the darkest hour, in the worst situation. Give your praise to God. Mark that time, paint that canvas, and let God know that no matter what's going on, you're one of His. Yes, yes amen. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah. Then he tells us in 1 Corinthians, he explains what's exactly what was going on. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. What do I gain, humanly speaking, if I fought with beasts at Ephesus? This is what he's talking about. He's saying, these people in Ephesus who made me so depressed I felt like a death sentence was on me. I despaired of life. I thought I'd never get through it. I thought it was over, ended, finished. That's it. He said, I fought with peace in Ephesus. And I fought with me over the resurrection. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. He's saying... The reason why you need to mark and avoid these people who bring divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines of Christ is because if you hang around them, they will corrupt your morals. Amen. When I was about 12, my father said to me one day, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And I looked at him and I just thought to myself, another stupid saying. I don't understand that. How can you know who I am by looking at the people I'm hanging around with? Because you're going to be like them. Bad company corrupts good morals. He's saying, I raised you good, but you're becoming bad because you're hanging around with bad people. And that's what Paul is saying. I fought with beasts at Ephesus. Those beasts weren't wild animals of the field. They were Jews. They were the Judaizers. They were the ones who were saying, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. Don't believe him. There's no resurrection. We're not going. It was the unbelievers. It was the, 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 uh, the Ephesian religious people who worshipped Diana the goddess and this and that. And they're causing contrariness, divisions, problems, things. Mark them. Avoid them. Hang around them. You'll become like them. <laughs> Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Quickly back in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. In, his, in the English Standard Version. He says, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you? Who put a spell on you? Hello? <coughs> who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you? Who did it? The serpent seed. I, I, I preached Christ crucified before you. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit? Did you receive the promise of eternal life? Did you receive the covering for your nakedness? Did you receive that by doing good deeds and doing good works like others do? No. You received it by faith. Are you now so foolish that once you began in the Spirit, now you're trying to finish up by doing good works? And thinking that doing good works is what's going to be the thing that you need? Have you suffered so many things in vain? He said, you've been through problems, trials, tribulations. It's all in vain if you go their way. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12. I want to just get into one more part just to kind of finalize and make one example of something so we can understand this serpent seed situation and that we can read the Bible and, and see clearly what Paul is talking about himself. Second Corinthians chapter 13, uh, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. And he says this. One of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. 
So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations I received, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan. To harass me. To keep me from becoming conceited. He's referring to the beast in Ephesus who burdened him so much with the problems that they created that he despaired of life. And he says, but it made me, 2 Corinthians 9, 1, 9, indeed, I felt I had received the sentence of death, but that was to help me to understand I had to rely not on myself, but on God who raises the dead. So even if you feel like you're going to die, then you're in good company because Jesus was dead, but God raised him from the dead. So Paul, he was talking about a thorn in the flesh, an angelic messenger, a messenger of Satan. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Suck it up. Get over it, cried Amy. You see, one of the problems we have as Christians is that we want counseling all the time for the problems we face. Mm -hmm. We go to our counselors and we tell them, I'm in such a hard time. I'm, 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 I'm in such a bad place. Mm -hmm. And the counselor says, oh, don't worry. You know, the Lord loves you anyhow. It'll be okay. I don't feel like it's going to be okay. I know I'll never get over this. The counselor should say, suck it up, Christian. Be a good soldier. Look what happened to Paul. He fought peace in Ephesus. Look at Jesus. He was he had spit in his face. What do you got? Have you been bleeding lately? Paul said, they, they beat me, they stoned me, they threw me over a wall. What have they done to you? They made fun of me. <laughs> Tough it up. Let's go. Be a warrior. Get in the army of God. Amen. Somebody give God some praise. Amen. Amen. That's my counseling to you. <laughs> I told my father the other day on the phone, I said, hey, Dad, I said, you know, one of the things that happens in our church, I don't get much counseling going on. People don't come to me for counseling because they know I'm going to tell them to toughen up, suck it up, and get over it. Yeah. You, you want me to pat them on the back? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. He told me that. Forget about it. He told me that. Amen. What are you? And, and I said to him, I said, usually the question I ask him right away is, are you saved? Are you saved? If you're saved and you're going through this and you know the word of God, what are you doing crying? <laughs> Moses does 10 miracles in Egypt. Does great and mighty things in Egypt. And then God brings him with 2 million Egyptian, uh, Jewish people out of Egypt, brings him to the, to the Red Sea, and, and he tells them, I want you to camp here tonight. Just camp here. We're on the run. Pharaoh's behind us. Chariots with swords in the wheels that go around like this. They chop you in pieces. He's got horsemen. They've got long spears. They're, 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 they're warriors. What are we? Bricklayers. What do we got to fight with? A trowel? Moses is crying before God. And God says to him, Now I want you to turn around and I want you to face the enemy. And I want you to face this mountain right over here, this mountain. And, and Moses is like, why do you want us to face this mountain? I, I, I know what they call that mountain. They call that the mountain of, the, of Baal something or other there. And he's a, he's, a, he's a god. And they worship him. And you want us to face him? Yeah, I want you to face him. I want you to camp here all night. I want you to pitch your tents and camp here. Well, we're on the run. And the next day, all the people are murmuring, yeah. complaining. Right. What's wrong with this man? He's yeah. going crazy. Yeah. He made us camp here. He made us camp and look at this yeah. place where they worship a false god. Yeah. One of the demon gods of the, of the other people. Yeah. What are we doing? Yeah. And God says to Moses, yeah. come out here before the people. And Moses walks out before all the people and stands there. And he says to God, he says, God, what are we doing? What's going on? I've been with you so far, but now I don't know. I'm questioning you. And the word of God says, and the Lord said to Moses, what are you crying for? What do you have in your hand? 
That's the blood. Has it worked all the time so far? Yes, yeah, it's worked every time. Well, it'll work again! <laughs> Raise it up and split the sea! Okay! <laughs> Splits the sea. The God that was there on the mountain that the, that, the, that the foreigners were worshiping was the God of the sea. He was a God of the Egyptians. One of their gods. Why did God bring them to that place, at that place, right there, so that they could face this mountain where they worshiped a false god, the god of the sea. He was the patron god of the sailors and all those guys. And he brings them right there and he makes them stay there because God's getting in his face. God is saying to Baal, whatever his name was, he says, watch this. This is the finale. Woo. You got your guys over here? You're going to kill all my guys? I don't think so. You see, you're in trouble. You're going through it. It's all because God said, I got a lot of stuff invested in this one here. And the enemy says, oh yeah? Well, that's the one I'm after. And God says, well, go ahead, try it. And he says to you in your prayer time, don't forget, you can make it. You'll be okay. Keep praising me. Remember that song you sang the other day about worshiping me in a time of trouble? Remember the storm that you had a vision of coming? Well, it's coming tonight. And you're hit so hard, you, be, you despair of life itself. You feel like you're fighting wild beasts. Your own children. Yes. Your husband. Your mother. Your father, your sister, your cousin, your aunt, your grandmother, your neighbors, your teachers, your, your, your co-workers. They're all against you. Why? Because you've been living as a Christian and they keep on trying to corrupt your manners. Why don't you come out drinking with us? We're going to go to a party. How about this? Listen to this one. And you don't go along with it. Why? Because bad company corrupts good manners. I'm not going to, good morals. I'm not going to get into that. And yet you've been, they've been after you and after you and after you. And God's just waiting for you to just praise them. In your weakness... You are strong. Because God knows what he's doing. The minute you start crying out, oh God, oh God, you're saying, I don't believe in you. You deserted me. And God says, I called you to myself. I died on the cross. I rose from the dead. I gave you the spirit of life. And you don't trust me? You can't go through this for me? You can't do this for me? I did all that for you? Are we friends? Wow. Do you love me? Wow. And what do we say? Well, I want to love you. I'm trying to love you. Yeah. All right, well, then get up and praise me. And let God's love break through. Amen? Yeah. Come on, give God some praise today. Hallelujah. <laughs> It doesn't matter if it's a messenger of Satan. It doesn't matter if it's the devil itself. It doesn't matter who it is or what it is. It doesn't matter what the circumstance is, what the situation is. It's the serpent's seed, and they're after you. And they're going to try to crush your head, but you've got to crush their, their head. You've got to get them. And you've got to know that you're a fighter. You're a warrior. So he says, he sent me a messenger of Satan to harass me. And I pleaded with the Lord, oh, Lord, please, three times. But the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. <laughs> And my power is made perfect in your weakness. My power is demonstrated in your weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so the power of Christ can rest upon me. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Some people say that the, the, the thorn in the flesh was being sick. He doesn't say it was being sick. He says it was a messenger of Satan. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Numbers chapter 33, verse 55, and understand this thorn in the flesh thing. Numbers 33. God is speaking to Moses to tell Joshua, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land that is in front of you, then those of them whom you let remain shall be barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land you live in. He's saying when he brought them to the promised land, he said, you've got to evacuate. You've got to eliminate. You've got to get rid of every one of these guys that are here. They're the serpent seed. Mm. Complete. Corrupt. Incorruptible. Not, I mean, you can't be saved. And he says, if you don't get rid of them all, they will be a thorn in your flesh. A thorn in your side. Joshua chapter 23, verse 11. He says this. Be very careful, Joshua 23, 11. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. 
For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and marry them, so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. They shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off the good ground that the Lord our God has given you. Mm. This thorn in the flesh wasn't because he was sick. He was fighting beasts. He was fighting the serpent seed. He was in such de desperate battles for, the, for his own life and for the life of those he was ministering to that he despaired of life. But then he realized, even in my despairing of life, I have to praise the one who raises the dead. If they slay me, yet will I praise him. Isn't that the prophetic word we heard this, word we heard this morning? Though he slay me, yet will I praise him. I will paint a canvas in the midst of the storm. Come on, folks. Can't you see how God's setting us up today with prophetic words and exhortations to get you to the point where you start to say, I will never give up. I will never give in. I will stop complaining. I will not be a murmurer. I will not be a complainer. I'm a warrior. I will fight. I will praise. I will worship. I will win. I'll crush his head. Amen. And that's the weak applause you give? <laughs> Come on and Woo! praise God. Hey, hey, hey. Glorify Come on. the Lord your God. Yes, Lord. And the last thing I want Woo! to do again is Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. I beseech you, brethren. I'm begging you, brothers and sisters. I know you've got some friendships you shouldn't have. I know you're going places you shouldn't be going to. I know you're doing things you shouldn't ought to do. I'm telling you, mark those that cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrine which you learned. And avoid them. They're not serving our Lord Jesus Christ. Their own bellies they serve. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Those who are opposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ are the serpent seed. That's how it was in the garden. That's how it is now. But the battle is won. But it's not over yet. <laughs> But you're winning, even though you're losing. God will turn it around. As they say, and I love this saying, he may not come when you want him to, but he's never late. He's going on his time schedule, his timetable. He knows when he needs to show up. When Paul and Silas are in that jail, they've been beaten. I mean, come on. Here's two guys preaching the word of God. What do they get for that? They get beat up. They get whipped. They get thrown in the bottom of the dungeon. And they're sitting down there. And Silas says to Paul, what time is it? Paul says, it's time to praise the Lord. And they start singing songs of praise. And the Bible says, and everybody heard them. Then they start singing. Nobody knows the troubles I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. So they started singing, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory is mine today. I told Satan, get me behind. Victory is mine today. And the young guys say, what are they singing about? What are you talking about? They're talking about, they're talking about some type of battle, some type of serpent war they were talking about before. The serpent seed, the seed war. I don't know what they're talking about. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Next thing you know, the doors burst open. Why? Because God sent the messenger from him. And he broke open the door so not just to them, but to everybody. I tell you, when you get set free, others get set free. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. When there are people in bondage, you get set free, they get set Lord. free. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. They got set free. God set them free, and God wants to set you free today. He yes. wants to set you. He wants to make you free. He says if the truth sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Woo. Glory. Just watch who you hang out with. Yes. Because there's people in the churches that they don't belong to the Lord's side. That's right. Their God is their belly. They're just after the yeah. things of the flesh. Yeah. They have not yet really come to the Lord. Yeah. Jesus, the, the Apostle John said, they're not, they're not of us. Even though they, they went out from us, they weren't a part of us. Because yeah. if they were a part of us, they'd have never left us. That's right. You wonder why there's problems? Because some people are just not really serving God. And Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. So who's the serpent seed? Anybody who's not on Jesus' side. Just avoid them. 
He'll fellowship with you. You got to preach to them. You got to give them a good word. You got to live a good life in front of them. You got to be an example. You have to show them what's right and wrong. You have to do those things, but you don't have to do it in a bad way. You just got to do it. You just got to live your life. And if they complain to you or tell you you're getting in their face, you tell them that's all right. Don't worry about it. You should see Jesus. If he was here, he'd really get in your face. <laughs> you filthy <feel too> rat. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Leave that to Jesus. Amen? He would give you the strength. God's going to give you the strength that you need. He's going to give you the strength of your life. He's going to take care of you. He's going to be with you. You're going to, you're going to walk with him. You're going to talk with him. You're going to fellowship with him. No matter what's going on in your life, you've got Jesus on your side. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand up together. Make a confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he arose again according to the scriptures and he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there he will come and judge the living and the dead and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and adored and who spoke through the prophets. And I believe in one church the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. Our confession of faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, O Lord God, consider your handmaidens, consider your servants, consider your children, consider your people and the things they're going through. Lord, they've been going through things like sicknesses and problems and trials and tribulations. Father, they've been going through things with problems with brothers and sisters and family members. They've been going through troubles on the job and off the job. They've been having situations that have been crushing them and making them feel like they've been forsaken. But Lord God, I pray right now in their hour of weakness that you manifest your strength. That your strength be demonstrated in their weakness. And that you lift them up. And let them serve you and praise you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. Give somebody a handshake, a hug. God bless you in Jesus' name. Go forth. You are more than a conqueror. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. God bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God.